Okay, good evening. Um, welcome to the Overseas Press Club of America. I'm the executive director, Patricia Kranz. Um, tonight, uh, a longtime NET member, Linda Fasulo, has helped organize this panel with um, a host of veteran experts about the UN. And we're, we're very excited that the timing is very good after a new Secretary General lead up to the US election. Um, and uh, given how international issues are um, important, uh, if, depending on, no matter which candidate wins the US election, uh, this panel is very timely. Um, I think most of you know about the Overseas Press Club. I see a lot of members here and members of, behind me. Um, but if, if you don't, we, we encourage you to join if you're a journalist interested in international affairs. And we have a lot of interesting programs and an awards dinner. And we offer um, press IDs and, and training seminars and um, various other things. So with that, I will uh, turn it over to Linda Fasulo, who is a longtime OPC member and um, a and a veteran independent correspondent for NPR News at the UN, and she's the author of An Insider's Guide to the UN. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, Patricia. Well, I'd like, first of all, to welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening. As Patricia said, we do have a rather timely um, program tonight. tonight. In terms of the United States, we have the first vice president's uh, debate, and tomorrow at the UN, the Security Council will be conducting the sixth straw poll. Many of you know what that is. It's an informal polling by the uh, Security Council members. But what makes tomorrow different is that for the first time, there'll be color-coded uh, color coded ballots that will indicate which of the P5 are vetoing. Right now, there's there's uh, there are three people in the lead, Antonio Guterres, uh, former Prime Minister of Portugal, and all of you may know him. For 10 years, he was the uh, UN High Commissioner for Refugees. He's in the lead. He has uh, 12, as they say at the UN, they will never say when we're against you, that he has two uh, discouraged, two people at the UN on the council that discouraged his uh, nomination, but 12 are in favor. So part of the big uh, suspense tomorrow will be are those two people veto holding members? Because of course, if one of them is and vetoes, he's history. Anyway, so tomorrow will be a very interesting day at the UN. And so I think this is a very propitious moment to begin. We have an outstanding panel. I know all of them. I've known them for many years. And we're I'm very appreciative that they're all here tonight. They're all very seasoned, insightful, experienced. And I have to say, first and foremost, they're all very nice. A few of them are very funny. And we may have one that's a particularly a character. <laughs> but anyway, to begin, um, joining us tonight will be Steve Schlesinger, right here, historian, author of uh, the very uh, popular book, The Act of Creation, The Founding of the United Nations. He's also a commentator on the United Nations. Next to me is Kader Abadi long-time UN um, official. He was, he's worked at the UN, I didn't realize this, he worked at the UN beginning in 1961 with Dag Hammarskjöld, and he left in 1997, I guess, when Kofi Annan, during the early days of the Kofi Annan administration. He retired, and his last post was director of the UN Office of Political Affairs. He has a new book out, it's called From the Garden to the Glass House, an, an Undiplomatic View of the United Nations. So we hope he'll share some of those undiplomatic perspectives. Starting on my left is Richard Roth, the inimitable Richard Roth, veteran CNN correspondent, and as I was alluding, a very funny one. And finally to the left is uh, also the inimitable Ian Williams, uh, he's currently the correspondent for the nation at the United, at, at, following the UN, and he's also the author of a new book, A Beginner's Guide to the to the United Nations. No, United Nations for Beginners. No, no, that was the previous one. It's Untold. 
Oh my the God! Story of the UN. That's why we didn't know it. We don't have that. Now you've told Not us. out yet. It's not out yet, but it will be. In any case, uh, it's a pleasure to introduce all of you, to have you here, and to begin. We'll start at the beginning with the creation of the UN, and I turn to Steve Schlesinger. Thank you, thank you, Linda. Is this on? Yes, it is. Um, the, the title of this event is the UN in the World Today. So using that as a kind of stepping stone, I want to address what I think is the biggest weakness of the UN and, and ask whether it, in fact it is a weakness or not. The biggest weakness in my mind, at least in the public mind too, is its failure to end conflicts, which is after all the main mission that was that was why the UN was created in the first place. Um, and the way they did it was either to do intervene in the conflict or use diplomacy. So the question is, what does the UN's ledger on those issues show after 71 years of, of, of existence? I'm reminded of all this by a book review which appeared just two weeks ago in the New York Times by an excellent historian named Lynn Olson. She's written books like The Citizens of London about Americans in London during the Second World War, Those Angry Days about Lindbergh and his isolationist movement, and The Morrow Boys about Edward Morrow's group of journalists also during the Second World War. She reviewed two weeks ago a new book by Joseph Lallefeld called His Final Battle about FDR's last year now, in it, she says, in reference to Lallyville's account of how Roosevelt established the UN, that FDR, like Woodrow Wilson with his League of Nations, quote, failed to achieve his ultimate goal. The United Nations, created in October 1945, was never able to function as an effective keeper of world peace, end of quote. Well, I find that a quite remarkable statement by a serious historian like Olson. She's recycling the old cliche that's been thrown around for years about the UN, that it's ineffective in establishing peace. Well, let me go back and recount what exactly has happened in these 71 years. First, there hasn't been a third world war. I mean, the whole point of the UN was to make sure there wasn't a third world war, and there hasn't been one in 71 years. Second, look at the peaceful settlements the UN has devised over, over that period of time in Cambodia, Guatemala, El Salvador, Mozambique, Sierra Leone, Burundi, Namibia, Liberia. And of course, well, there are ongoing efforts, not so, not so successful as of yet, in Kosovo, Afghanistan, Haiti, Sudan, Cyprus, the Congo, and the Central African Republic. Now, this is not to deny the UN's flaws. We all know what they are. The most obvious, frankly, are that the fact that conflicts particularly in Syria, are still ongoing after five years, and ongoing in Yemen, and Libya, Ukraine, and the Congo. But this does not take away the successes it, it, it has had. And in any case, the design of the UN in 1945 uh, has predominated throughout the history of the organization, especially the veto power, which only five states possess. Now, the veto was set up by Franklin Roosevelt simply to avoid the flaws of the old League of Nations. Its failures were partly as a result of the fact that every country in the League had the veto, which meant a single rogue country could block anything that the League was trying to accomplish. And also, FDR believed that in his kind of realist appreciation of power in the world, that the, that the five countries who had the most powerful militaries in 1945 should run the organization. They were the ones who could supply the armament to fulfill a UN mission. Now, uh, this was not a particularly happy or popular idea when the, Secretary, when the San Francisco conference happened in 1945. Many of the smaller states opposed the idea of the veto. Um, but that's, frankly, is the way that those are the cards that this, this world organization have been dealt. One of the reasons, another reason he wanted the veto is that he knew that the, the treaty could never be passed the U.S. Senate without the U.S. having that particular power, and he couldn't enlist the Soviet Union in the organization without it. Now, all right, so that's the setup of the U.N. The one thing that is virtuous in his uh, 
formation of, of the UN is the UN Charter, which turns out to be a, an immensely flexible document. Member countries have learned to work within it and around it to do all sorts of initiatives that didn't exist in the original charter language. For example, peacekeeping, nation building, election monitoring, police training, and now even today a more open race for the UN next UN Secretary General. This has kept the UN responsive to new crises as the decades have passed. And even with a low key and somewhat remote Secretary General like Ban Ki-moon, he's had some impact on global warming, on forming, forming a new agency called UN Women, on passing a provision for recognition of LGBT rights. Um, and uh, now he has endorsed the, uh, the uh, SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, which are in place for the next uh, 15 years. Um, and for that matter, President Obama has done more with the UN than any of his predecessors, recognizing that the UN is a very valuable part of US, US American foreign policy, starting with sanctions on Iran and North Korea, the Libya intervention, whether you agree with it or not, was a UN deal, climate change, revamping peacekeeping, the uh, nuclear security summit of 2010, and uh, the support of the Small Arms Trade Treaty in 2013. And there are other issues that he's, he's, uh, he's uh, pushed for in the UN. My point is that the, this casual dismissal of the UN's efforts to settle disputes, which we saw in Lynn Olson's review and we hear so often, particularly in the United States, is very short-sighted. Still, many, many things have, have yet to be done at the UN. Many changes really have to be uh, undertaken. A lot of think tanks, just in this particular year, like the International Peace, it, 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 the IPI, the International Peace Institute, have come out with long reports ad advocating all sorts of different changes and reforms. But my point again is that the UN has shown on, a, on many occasions that it is capable of doing its main mission, which is to negotiate peaceful settlements. And it still has that ability to do so in the future. Thank you. Well, thank thank you. you. And turning to our second speaker. Oh, here. You need to share. Okay. Mr. Abadi. Thank you, Linda. First of all, thank you for coming here tonight. I see some of our colleagues corresponded at the UN, including our president of the ANCA Correspondent Association. Thank you for showing up here on a night like this. I also want to thank uh, Ms. Kranz for organizing this meeting and to thank, of course, our moderator with her broad smile always. These are more the adversaries. <laughs> um, we are tackling the question of the UN facing the world. And uh, we are all historians of the UN here on this panel. So it's no surprise that we'll overlap from time to time. But I am. Uh, looking at the UN with a critical eye. Uh, my book is called An Diplomatic Look at the United Nations. And I mean that I have seen the organization from many points of view, from the point of view of a staff member of 30 years there, from the point of view of a diplomat. I served on two, two years as a diplomat with the delegation. I served as a journalist, I'm still a journalist, I served as an academic, so I looked at it from inside and outside, and I had to come to some conclusions. Uh, but the UN, as Professor Lesinger said, has weaknesses and has strength. But let me go through some of my general comments, and then we'll open it to discussion after everybody made their points. I hope it will be <coughs> interesting. In the 21st century, we are witnessing an area of increasingly fast development and complex problems and crises. It's a cliche to say that today's global problems and crises require global solution and stop at that. What we need is a new and creative thinking, new and innovative structures, and a modern means of management for this crisis. 
This is the story of the United Nations. This is what I describe in my new book, I'm Diplomatic Look at the United Nations. The United Nations, born on 26 June 1945, lacks those means. Its structures are old, its financing inadequate. It needs dynamic and visionary leadership. Those means are necessary for the organization to be able to face the issues of our turbulent world. In the 60s, the Chinese used to say, under the quiet heavens, there is a turmoil. Today, there is turmoil even in the heavens. The atmosphere and the skies are polluted. The crisis of climate change is only one. The UN faces many crises, as you very well know. Political crisis and conflict. Crisis of terrorism. Crisis of refugees and migrants. Humanitarian crisis. Crisis of corruption. Crisis of confidence in government and in some institutions. There are no statements, statesmen today in the world with courage and vision as we used to see some of them, some of them in the past. These crises cover the planet and they are not limited to one region. The question is, how is the UN facing up to this crisis? I submit that it is doing it with delay and timidity. We delay because of lack of consensus among the negotiators and also because of lack of readiness to compromise. With timidity, because it's easier to adopt declarations than plans of actions which require financial resources. Today, governments are reluctant to provide the money more and more. With timidity also, because of passive UN leadership instead of dynamic and bold leadership that invokes Article 99 of the UN Charter. As you know, under this article, the Secretary General is empowered to uh, bring to the attention of the Security Council any matter which, in his opinion or her opinion, we don't have her yet, may threaten international peace and security. That power is always at the disposal of the Secretary General. The results are that problems, conflicts, and crises accumulate. We have a long list of unresolved ones before the Council, all the new ones. Take some of the old ones, 40, 50, 60, more than that, years old, like the conflict in Kashmir, like between India and Pakistan, like the Middle East conflict between Israel and Palestinians, like Cyprus between the Greece and Turkey, like Western Sahara between Morocco and the Polisario. No ones like Syria, Iraq, and Yemen, all these remain to be resolved. The, what are the consequences of these conflicts uh, not being tackled? The UN can be seen as inefficient, to some extent irrelevant. Members, remember the lack of action during the Rwanda genocide in 1940, 1994. Let's look at some recent examples. The US and Cuba a few months ago established diplomatic relationship. It wasn't the UN that contributed to that, it was Pope Francis. On Syria, we wait for Secretary of State John Kerry and Russian Foreign Minister Lavrov to work things out before the UN Special Envoy Stefan de Mistura and the UN step in. In Asia, China established the Asia Infrastructure and Investment Bank, which many Western countries joined. It will compete with the IMF because no efforts were made to restructure the IMF to recognize the reality of the economic and political weight of China and other countries, such as the emerging countries, Brazil and India, and so forth and so on. All this does not mean that the UN has not done good work. Indeed, it has. It was instrumental in bringing the end of colonial rule in the 60s. It contributed decisively to the liberation of South Africa from the rule of apartheid. Its specialized agencies like UNICEF and WHO do great work. Add to this the Paris Agreement on climate change, which seems to be success. But the UN can do much better. To be able to do that, it needs to revitalize institutions and structures, more funding. It needs to tackle the root causes of conflict and to use preventive diplomacy. We have 
a budget of eight billion dollars devoted to peacekeeping. Eight billion dollars. We have a mere pathetic one million devoted to preventing diplomacy. I think that is unacceptable. It needs a dynamic and visionary leadership, such as during the times of Dag Hammarskjöld. Will it choose such leader? Will it choose such leader this month as the new Secretary General? I don't believe so. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> now turning to our panelists at the end. Ian. <laughs> okay. The end of the <laughs> <laughs> We're skipping. We're skipping the two. Anyway, our next panelist is, is Ian Williams. Okay, that was almost unexpected. I would <laughs> listen. Um, <clears throat> Your, uh, oh, mic here. Yes, I suppose with the um, otherwise I'd have no difficulties with being heard on my ear. Is that on? Yes, it is indeed. Um, you know, the I always think about the UN the same way that Churchill, who I don't often quote, is very quotable, but I don't often yeah. agree with his quotes. Uh, some of the things he's one of the things he said about democracy was it was the worst possible system except all the alternatives. And that's very much how I feel about the UN. I mean, you know. Hey, you want knocking stories on the UN? I love them. You know, Perez de Cuer was once asked, how many people work at the UN? And he paused. This is one of the few witty things ever true to him. Oh, about half, he said. <laughs> Which I suspect there's a bit of an exaggeration going to some of the people I know. <laughs> but it's still, the point about the UN is it exists as a catalyst. And I look at it and the way it's regarded, for a start, in the UN, in the US, ever since I came here in 1989, the default mode of treating with the UN has been sneeringly dismissive. From left to right. That's how people talk about the UN. It's how they think about it. They wash their hands of it. And I think it was very instructive to contrast the, uh, the obituaries for Buttress Ghali with what was said about him while he was alive and in office. This revered elder statesman who did so much, who contributed so much, and he spent five years being reviled by the whole political and foreign policy establishment. And, you know, we discovered he did have hidden depths and he was arrogant and he had lots of problems, but he was also very acute and he produced a lot of innovations within, within the UN. But he had to wait until he popped his clogs, as we say in the north of England, <laughs> for anyone to notice this. I mean, at the same time, I mean, I'm sorry, Stephen, I think you're... I do think that Ban Ki-moon is a much misunderestimated person as a Secretary General. There are not many Secretary Generals who, in the hustings, this time 10 years ago, actually stood up when John Bolton was behind him. And in response to my question said, I completely believe in the International Criminal Court and I will do everything I can to operationalize it. So I thought at the time the guy is either terminally stupid, or he's a leftover kamikaze pilot still wanting to crash on the deck, or he's a person of integrity, and I default on the latter one since then. You know, we are too easy to dismiss these things. And, and the UN is so complex. Who is it? What is it? You, you, several, we mentioned the contrast with the League of Nations. I actually did some, you must have done this as well. A lot of the UN Charter is basically the League of Nations rewritten with a veto, other than a few other little ones and suds. Except the League of Nations had a great deal of respect for self-determination of peoples in a Wilsonian way, unless they were Germans or Hungarians or <laughs> blacks and, and Africans and people like that. But they had a lot more respect for it. Whereas the difference in the United Nations was it was to deal with conflicts between states. It was invasions, conflicts between states and encroachment of others that the UN has been dealing with. But I mean, I agree with you what it said. It's been almost like the British Constitution. It's, infinitely malleable, even though it stays the same. You can, they can do things with it. You can invent peacekeeping. You can invent responsibility to protect. And you know, a lot of people, especially a lot of people in Aleppo at the moment, are obviously very upset with the responsibility to protect. Uh, <laughs> you can't say the that. Well. at the bottom. What? At the bottom. <clears throat> okay. Ah, uh, there we go. Uh, oh, obviously, not exactly ecstatic about the responsibility to protect, but it was one of the great steps forward, I think, in international law and international consciousness. And we have to realize that uh, Kofi Annan 
seized the opportunity. He knew that you couldn't change the UN Charter. So basically, he got the whole of the world's statesmen in one place and got them to agree on reinterpreting the Charter. Because a threat to peace actually meant people killing their own people inside their own territory. I mean, that's basically what he did. And, you know, a lot of us are disappointed. But I'm looking at the, those of us at the time who've been following this are actually amazed by how much the concept has taken legs. When even the Russians are invoking it to justify their behavior in Georgia and Ukraine, <laughs> okay, it's honored much more in the breach than the observance, but at least it's honored. And that's one of the points about the UN. Kofi said this as well, that it was its unique legitimizing role, which was really important. Just think, all of those people in the Republican Party, they hated the UN so much, they were desperate to get UN legitimation for their invasion of Iraq. They kept trying to find substitutes. You know, they had the coalition of the Duke, the coalition of the willing, the coalition of the bribe, all sorts of stuff. But they wanted the UN to do it, and they couldn't. And that's why, you know, lots of people are wandering around the world, checking with their lawyers as well as their travel agents when they go, because they broke international law, and they know it. Um, Tony Blair is a case in point, Henry Kissinger, another one. These things, there are hopes. So, what's the hope for the future? I mean, the problem is, I'm a bit of a iconoclast. Um, I do not think the Security Council should be enlarged. I think that if it, it's on the verge of being too big to actually function effectively at the moment. I think it's absurd to talk about democracy and the Security Council when you have absolute dictatorship sitting on there. And the idea that you enhance democracy by doubling the number of permanent seats, it's as bit as though you went back to Britain and said, we're going to increase democracy in the House of Lords by doubling the number of hereditary peers. You might increase the number and the balance, but you're not increasing democracy under any circumstances. So, you know, there are solutions in the Security Council. It does have a problem of legitimacy. And part of that problem is the behavior of some of the permanent five. Now, the US and Russia are both prone to invoke the UN when it suits them and to ignore it when it doesn't. And then they wonder why nobody else listens to them when they invoke the principle. Uh, and we let them get away with it. We always let them get away with it because it's amazing how the press in both places is incredibly partisan. We do not call our own rulers into question. Uh, you know, we're all being very, yeah, yeah, well, it's sort of freedom of the press here. Um, if you look at the press consensus in the US and Britain over the Iraq war, there was probably more dissent in the Russian press, <laughs> on average, I think. Probably more dissent in the Chinese press even. Everybody went along because they would lose their jobs if they didn't. Rupert Murdoch is no more gentle of dissent than is Vladimir Putin. Different source, you're not gonna get locked up as a British or American journalist. You're not going to get disappeared or meet strange people with umbrellas pointing at you. But you're not going to advance in your career very well if you, if you actually tell the truth too often. So, I mean, I think we have to have this comparison. We need the UN. The UN needs the United States. It needs the permanent members behind it. And that means it needs the citizens of those countries to ensure that they live up to their international responsibilities. And that's something the press has got to do. I don't point out when they don't. You know, for example, at the moment, Britain, my native country, is discussing trident and rearmament. Uh, and it's being discussed in a framework that completely misses out Britain's obligations under the comprehensive, uh, under the non proliferation treaty and the UN Charter. It's not just stupid to spend billions of dollars on building submarines with nuclear tipped missiles. It's actually illegal. It's breaching our treaty obligations in Britain. And even at the moment in the United States, it's, it's weird that the candidates seem to be quiet about this. There's a huge movement to rearm the US and to reach retool with nuclear weapons, and that's against all the agreements and treaties which we're preaching to others. We're telling to the Iranians, we're telling to the North Koreans and saying, no, you can't do that. And, and by the way, uh, the next budget has got more than your sort of entire GDP for the next 50 years to build new missiles. It's our responsibility if we support the UN to call our own governments to account. And if you want, um, we, we, we don't want to the Secretary General stuff at the moment, do we? We'll leave it to the audience. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the sumo, the, the, the tag sumo wrestling match. <laughs> okay. <laughs>
attention. Over to you. Uh, I'll uh, use my own mic. <laughs> no. Uh, good evening. And someone leaves immediately. As soon as I <laughs> All right. You're Sorry. <laughs> that man is my brother. No. Um, I, I'm the only one on this panel who hasn't written a book, but uh, after tonight I'm thinking of starting one later. Um, we have enough people here for a minion, uh, for those of a certain religion, and also to form a security council. We have 15, and who wants to play New Zealand tonight? Form a circle. Uh, I agree with most of what was said. I will uh, to try to give you some real insight. Uh, I shared a bedroom in Japan with one of these panelists. Can you guess? Was it contested one, <laughs> two, three, or four? Any guesses from this so far mobile audience? Oh, he's not looking at his device. I've got his attention. Go ahead. Three. This young lady. Yeah. All right. Any other guesses? Well, because he just pointed at himself. Uh, it, it was with Ian Williams in uh, Fukuoka, Japan, in 1995. And, uh, you know, he, anyway, it was, uh, was it good for you that night? Um, uh, that was a budgeting issue, I believe, for the people who had invited us to Japan. And now he's back to his device. Uh, it's amazing. They go up the test. He heard bedroom or sleep or something. Uh, what will I, I just want to add briefly, okay, uh, before the questions, I don't know how many of you were here for the National uh, Stationary Association dinner that may be on another floor or actually are interested in the UN. Uh, how many of you work or are connected? Can we see by a show of hands and a show of awakeness? How many of you work or are connected to the UN or a UN mission or an NGO or foundation or a journalist? Come on, get them up. All right. <laughs> so I would say from the CNN point of view, for me, in the media, maybe these uh, fine people have not talked enough about that. I mean, this is the UN and you're in the media capital of the world and I still have issues with the way the UN is understood or gets its own message out. It's hamstrung. I mean, can you imagine a private company working well with 193 board members? I mean, they've explained the problems well. We talked about Ban Ki-moon, maybe he is misunderstood. Maybe years from now we're going to hear some real interesting stories. I mean, the, the Secretary General, the current man, waited nine months to hold a press conference this year. I'm not saying there was high demand, but it tells you a, a lot about him and his belief. Now, he went to Europe this week, Monday, press conference in Geneva. Tuesday, I think, press conference in so France, Strasbourg. It's different. I mean, he, he's always been worried about the UN press corps. And maybe he does find work behind the scenes. We may never know. There's uh, some qualities that were listed. But people don't think of the UN. I mean, look at how people are viewing this election. It is not a top priority of an American family. The husband or the wife doesn't get up and says, honey, they didn't mention the UN in the debate. And yet you remember the 1995, 94, 96, 96 convention, Robert, uh, Bob Dole, candidate for president, it seems hard to believe now, making fun of Boutros Boutros Ghali's name Prime time television, it was incredible when you look back. I still get a bit of a rush, maybe I'm, I, I need new thrills. I was looking at a conference room yesterday at the UN, and you see every country of the world sitting there, but maybe because we're in New York and you can, can get into a subway car with 42 different people from 37 different countries. But it's still interesting, but the UN has a way of making it dull and doesn't want to do anything that stands out. So you have New Zealand sitting there, and Uruguay, and all that different people from around the world, but only the UN can discuss an item by never even stating what they're discussing. It has to be agenda item 54 slash 2109. <laughs> and it just never wants to say who's the next speaker of the General Assembly. There are so many ways you can improve what is going on there. The, the very name Sustainable Development Goals is a pet peeve of mine and other journalists, SDG. I, I know you gotta call it something, but nobody knows, unless you're sadly sitting in poverty in a village, maybe, and if you're an NGO or part of the system, what the SDGs are. Something you can catch if you're not careful. Right, about. sustainable development. It could be something on a construction project on Third <laughs> Avenue. It's just, so there are improvements. I think we need to make time for questions. I'd be very curious 
so that we can blame other people other than the UN here when we take their questions. But thank you for coming tonight. I know some of you want to get home for the Orioles and Blue Jays. Go ahead. <laughs> thank you, Richard. I did say he was a quite comedic. Right? <laughs> anyway, we'd love to open the floor to questions. And if you'd like, uh, please introduce yourself and any affiliation. As the air goes off. <laughs> yes, oh, I really the sent them flying out here. That's <laughs> four. Yeah. You're going to? All right. We've got to have a quorum. We've got to have a certain minimal number of people. <laughs> Minion. Yes. I know. I had a hunch this man would ask a question. Can I go? Yes. Yeah. Uh, hello. This was it. Hello. Yeah. Please tell who you are. My, my name is Jordan. I can't say I am your correspondent as well. And um, I'm happy to listen to uh, veterans uh, in person, and every one of you has a lot of experience. And everyone touches something. But what we have to do to improve the United Nations? You worked for the UN for 30 years. You know there is a problem. 48. 48. There is a problem for the UN. I work for the UN for 12 years in peacekeeping. I know there is a problem. Carmen also was your correspondent. She worked for the UN. There is a problem. You don't touch. You just say there is a problem. But what has to be done to improve the United Nations to be more effective? You cannot have and approve the UN rating by keeping the status quo as you said, in Sahara since 1974, in Kashmir since 1948, in Palestine, in Cyprus, etc. Something has to be done. What has to be done? Thank you. Anyone can answer. <laughs> Thank you. I'd just like to add something to that. Since we're discussing the role of Secretary General, and uh, will that person make a I difference? May I, may I address this to the panel? How important is, is the next Secretary General? Will he or she really make a difference? help improve things? Does it matter who it is? Is there any way we could still get a 40 second answer from this gentleman who has actually worked for the UN and can tell us what the problem is? <laughs> well, well, I, I, you want to be independent? <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, we're, you know, on the outside here, comment. I, I, I know he was on the inside, but well, you were well, on the I, I, I think the problem is, um, I, I think, I prefer if you wait for my book because you uh, decided to write me. Okay, no, no, you decided to, to start. Right, thanks, you you want to start one, right? So, yeah, well, apparently, I'm not going Okay, <clears throat> would you like to start? Okay. First? Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Your first question what to do to, to improve. improve the UN? Okay. This book is not only a history of the United Nations. It's a critical history and it contains new proposals how to improve the UN and go beyond its current status. But let me, for example, just quote Ban Ki-moon in an interview yesterday in Geneva, how to improve the UN. He says, and I quote, I have called for the president of the General Assembly this current president to explore with my successor to be designated soon the establishment of a high level panel to find practical solutions that improve decision making of the United Nations. So you have a Secretary General here passing the buck to his successor and telling him to set up a panel to improve the decision making process at the UN. Now, coming back to Linda's question, where is the organ that decides at the UN? It's not the fourth committee or the General Assembly or the sixth committee. It's the Security Council. Now, this council, Jan said, and I respectfully disagree with my good wise friend, colleague here, People have been fighting for years, delegates as well as NGOs, to democratize the Security Council. They want to enlarge it, not necessarily by adding more uh, veto power, but to include the realities of the world 
including Germany and uh, Japan and India and back in uh, Mexico, maybe Brazil. How long can you get them out, keep them out of this community council? It's impossible to continue with, without. I believe that the time has come where when the security council either it will have to reform itself or it will be bypassed by other developments, namely, I mentioned an example, what will be developing <coughs> in the regions. They will have their own IMF, their own bank, their own uh, economic uh, councils, etc., etc., and they will bypass the human. That's what might happen in case we don't restructure the United Nations. Now, to questions of Linda, I do not think that any Secretary General will be appointed tomorrow or the days or the weeks after will make a lot of difference. I personally am against taking one of us and making them Secretary General. And I can develop the argument for a long time here. I was not in favor of having my colleague, Kofi Annan. I know he's very popular, but you know how many conflicts he resolved? You cannot point. You say zero. I will add just Timor Leste, that's all. But he <coughs> has superb public relations uh, 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 machine, and he is very likely lovable and friendly and very popular worldwide. But when it comes to the reality, it's a different story. You have to read my book to see what it is. But the Security Council is, we can discuss here a lot of. Uh, sub, uh, a lot of reforms of the council and how it can be shaped. Uh, uh, Dr. Schlesinger mentioned that the big powers got the veto. China was not a big power in 1945. France was defeated and occupied the nations. How did they get the veto? Think of that. Thank you. <coughs> Steve, would you like to respond? Yeah, I, I, uh, I, I think one of the things that we're missing here is the fact that when Roosevelt and his <clears throat> brethren, Churchill and Stalin, first set up the United Nations, the theory was that the five countries that had the veto were all part of the wartime alliance that won the Second World War. It is true that France was devastated during the, after the war, and China, too, was in a civil war by, in 1945. But uh, both Roosevelt and uh, Stalin and Churchill recognized that eventually Church China was going to recover and that France would itself be a major power once it had uh, regained its, its re reconstructed its own society. Um, and, but it was true that they were, made their own decisions based on the, what they considered the wartime alliance, which not which obviously today is not recognizing the power, real power realities that exist in 20. 16, which are very much different from what they were in 1945. But we have to deal with, as I said, the cards were dealt. When the cards are dealt right now, or five countries have a veto. So the, the only way you're going to get the UN to start behaving the way the designers originally wanted the organization to behave is to get those five countries to act together, which is what the original design was, to facilitate actions that carry out UN missions as the Security Council wishes. This happened during the intervention in the first Gulf, in the first Gulf War. Um, and it, that, that precedent surely could happen again if we could ever get some agreement on the Syrian situation. But if, as long as you have these great powers with the veto disagreeing on very fundamental issues, you're not going to get any, any real action by the United Nations. And that, unfortunately, is the reality we face these days. Thank you. Ian? Um, just to begin on the veto, the, the big three let in France and China to make it look slightly more democratic. <laughs> it was not recognition of anything. It was, to, it was to cover their position as having given themselves a veto, confident that neither China nor France were in a position to do anything about it. Because what people forget about the veto is it's real. We're not just talking about a theoretical gambit in the conference, a black hole in the club of membership. We're talking about the fact 
that it's impossible in the modern world for any combination of nations to force certainly the US and Russia to do anything they don't want to do. So the veto is real. And I actually think it's one of the secrets of the success and longevity of the UN that they recognize this. Because the minute they stop recognizing, one or other is going to walk out and we're going to have a League of Nations situation and the legitimizing authority goes. So we come to the Secretary General. They want a cat's paw. They want someone who's a secretary and not a general. It all comes out. And they're continually being amazed. I'm actually thinking of doing a, a look back at Trick Billy, because I think he must have had it in depth. He was vilified so much by so many people. I think he must have had something on his side. He actually complained about Dag Hammarskjöld, that Dag Hammarskjöld was a grey Scandinavian civil servant who was hopelessly ill-equipped for the task. And he was very likely right at the time, but Dag Hammarskjöld grew into the task. And then I remember Kofi Annan, because I think the key reform for the United Nations is to take the Human Resources Department off the continental shelf and use it for target practice until it sinks into the depths of the ocean. Kofi came to me at one point at a reception and he was complaining. He wanted to appoint someone to a position in his native country, Ghana, and Human Resources had been sitting on it for a year. So I said, Kofi, you should do what Butrus did. And he said, what is you should pass the message to the head of Human Resources, you are fired if this person isn't there in two weeks and authorize them to pass it down the line. He said, well, they'll go through procedures. They'll go through procedure outside. In the meantime, they'll be fired. They will move, do it. And I've found continually that human resources is one, is one of the key issues. And we're talking about the reforms here. The Secretary General need, needs to practice. We have to think about the staff who are coming now. I mean, it's happened since I came here. There are no professional UN civil servants anymore. Before we got time service, we got, I mean, you've got to see some of the old Russians who were working in the library department and places like that. And time servers was not like these people were, that they couldn't have been counted bottles. <laughs> well, except the empties. <laughs> there were lots of empty bottles in the Russian library department. What was missing was a professional civil service, but some people were dedicated. And they had security of tenure because they were civil servants. That's all disappeared. Everyone is on short term contract now. Beginning with Butcher Scarlet, carried on through Kofi Annan, what we got was a US commercial managerial size hire and fire. So you not only got you know you got incompetence selected, but they didn't even they couldn't even grow into something else. They couldn't even develop any traditions of uh, civil service and, uh, and core d'esprit. So everybody is looking over their shoulders. They go off to missions in faraway places, and they're looking over their shoulder at the local representative who is probably, you know, a complete corrupt rapist, and they can't do anything about it. I mean, this is a key point about modern United Nations, that the, the, the quality of the staff has been sapped, or at least, you know, the ability of the staff to rise. So come to the Secretary General. What can they do? They can do a lot. You know, there's all the guff about the secular Pope, but Kofi Annan helped the legitimacy. He was not the world's greatest orator. In fact, he was awful. He had all sorts of tuition in speaking from people. But he radiated authority. He radiated believability and credibility. And that was what made him, you know, that was that was what made it so good for him. You know, he he was a symbol. And that's what we really want, is we want a symbol, a flagship, somebody who the world thinks represents them. And that gives him his own authority. It's not the constitutional authority, it's not there. But you know, Kofi was very timid. I mean it's widely recorded that he said that the US war in Iraq was illegal. What's less widely recorded is he only said it because the BBC reporter had the microscope phone stuck up his nostril and wouldn't let go and asked it about three times. He grudgingly admitted that it was illegal. If Kofi Annan had actually got up and said so at an earlier stage of the proceedings and concerted it with Mark Malik Brown and his team, who were great amplifiers, it's a bit like Occupy, you know, when you shout something and everyone else shouts it. He had a great team around him who would shout on his messages afterwards, <laughs> like the Occupy people. And it, it, it was a wonderful form of amplification. And he could always deny it if they went too far. So you know, he, had a, he had a great operation going. And I think something like that, if he'd had a bit more courage about it, if he hadn't been an international civil servant for 30 years, used to obeying orders. <laughs> Excuse me, and I think we do have time for one more question. Oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> 
Well, I'm Abraham Joseph, I was special advisor to the Foreign Minister of East Timor, which is Timor Leste. And prior to that, I was with the UN for more than two decades, working on uh, social economic development issues. Do you have a book? I have a book. <laughs> <laughs> also on East Timor, how we move from crisis to recovery to development, we just launched the uh, UPI. Um, uh, my question is uh, relating to a recent report. Um, I'm sure all of you must have read the report of the High Level Panel on Peace Operations. Um, I just want to know your reaction uh, to this important report. Uh, do you think that it's going to have any impact on uh, peacekeeping? Um, and having also been on a mission to East Timor, um, in, in the uh, probably 10 years ago. Um, <clears throat> I must say that the there is need for training of the police and military. They have to know the culture of the country. Uh, in fact, uh, what I see is that they, they come mostly unprepared. You know, they have to be properly trained. Um, of course, while working in the UN, I just can't open my mouth, but at least now, you know, I can say very boldly to you that there is a big gap, uh, especially for the personnel that are being posted, um, especially for peacekeeping over. They need to be properly trained. I just want to make this observation. But please do, uh, just want to know your reaction. On the I'll be honest, I haven't seen that report, but the problem is there are too many reports. There are too many panels, too many symposiums, too many people speaking in that building. I, I want to look ahead and link it to what Linda asked and something to look forward to, maybe. the Now the tie for leading candidate, Kristalina Gurdjieva, in her rare only appearance before the media on this week, stressed she's a results-oriented person. She's gotten acclaim for some of her duties at the World Bank and elsewhere. She struck me as someone who is not just a bureaucrat. I think if she is elected, it would be interesting. You ask what could be approved. Do you want a secretary general who is on an airplane every day? Ban Ki-moon, in my opinion, is, and I'll talk fast because we're running out of time, has, has to have been the most traveled secretary general. Do you want someone like that to be like the town mayor, appearing, giving speeches, appearing at a panel, a conference, an AU summit, all that, when I would put that person in New York with a laser focus not and walking around the building saying, what do you do? Who are you? And I, the problem is, as you know, the countries control a lot of the job postings. You have this you know, Byzantine system of you've got to have this person and this person. But there's still, I think, somebody is needed a general inside the building uh, to, and then to also appear on behalf of the UN on talk shows. To, under Kofi Annan, he had a team speak. You would tune in, on, even on Fox, and they would get into a debate. No, the UN has disappeared in the public eye under the current Secretary General. Maybe that's for the best. I leave you with that. And just one final remark, Steve. Yeah, I just I just wanted to add that on the peace, I haven't read the report either, but uh, Obama, when he came to the UN this fall, has promised to inject a whole lot of American money into peacekeeping in order to improve the problems with peacekeeping. And, and training and, and, you know, the capacity of getting peacekeepers into particularly conflict areas and also addressing the whole cultural issue because we know that a lot of uh, peacekeepers come from totally different uh, cultures and don't understand what they're getting into when they uh, finally arrive on the ground. So there is something that is being done, at least from the American point of view, uh, in, in, in addressing the whole problems of being peacekeeping, which have become so obvious in the last couple of years. I mean, look, you've had the women and children getting raped, pillaged horribly in Africa and elsewhere. The head of peacekeeping is still the same person. Did that happen at a regular company? Maybe see Wells Fargo, but only one lowly person on the ground, uh, you know, the leader of a mission, was told to leave. You can do things depending on who's at the top and how open they want to be in front of the media. Use the forum you have. There were still, I can't believe it, there were still dozens of journalists who come to the UN every day. I'm not sure why, when considering the lack of information flow. I don't know who they're reporting for, but you have a sitting audience ready to you know, air 
the views of the Secretary General. And yes, Kofi Annan, he may have only had a team as a success, but he was seen, he was uh, said, remember, he went to Baghdad and talked to Saddam Hussein. I was in Jordan when Javier Perez Becquer was sent to the Middle East also about the first Gulf War. Have you ever seen Ba Ki-moon call to negotiate some solution? And I agree with Steve, the UN is already being bypassed. There are so many global financial groups, whether it's uh, Davos, Aspen, I mean, get-togethers, business groups, I mean, that is, and, but I think the UN countries want that. Yes, all right. Okay. I spoke so Tiny? much. Yeah. Tiny? Tiny response? Okay. Tiny. Tiny, tiny. I mentioned that peacekeeping up so, thank you. I mentioned that peacekeeping up so $8 billion while preventing diplomacy as only about a little over $1 million. I look at peacekeeping as failure, not as success of the United Nations. It's because it was not possible to resolve the political problem that we place peacekeepers to solidify the problem, to postpone the solution, to freeze the problem. And that's what has been happening. Something like that is so important that it should be in the Charter. Because the Charter has not been reformed, they go around it and then create institutions like peacekeeping. And if we continue on this way, the charter will be empty. And on that note, I'd like to thank our panelists for sharing their insights. And thank all of you for attending. Thank you very much.